What have I been up to? Well, I've been busy, actually. And what I want to show you a couple uh, in a couple of minutes are a few things. If you see by the title, I'm going to be talking about some the Canadian pastors that uh, that I haven't really looked at one of them, but the other one I have. And I'm going to look at that for a little bit. We're going to look at critical race theory. Um, I won't be doing too much commentary on that myself. Uh, I kind of know the gist of what it tries to do and how it divides. Um, but I'm going to have uh, others that are uh, other videos I'm going to pull and uh, share clips of what it exactly what it is. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention and Vody Bakum, and he'll be speaking to some of that in the clips that I pull. Um, there's going to be some updates on Pastor Tim Stevens and... What else am I leaving out? Uh, update on Grace Community Church, too. I did not put that in the title, so maybe I'll start with that. But before you do any of that, if you can, this is my YouTube channel. And obviously, um, content's been slow on this channel. So with that, I'm looking to pick it up. And I want you to, if you can, just subscribe here like I'm showing you now. Do that, and then hit the bell, and then scroll to the all, and you'll get an alert, just like this video, and how you get an alert. So, please do that. The last video that I shared uh, was actually when I spoke at my local church, So, of which the YouTube account is right here. You can click on that. I'll leave a video, I mean, a, not a video, a, a link in the description of this video for a link to that YouTube channel uh, of my church, is uh, Calvary Baptist Church. So... Please do that if you can. Moving forward, I want to show you something here. And I'm going to play this clip from CNN. And it has to deal with uh, what has happened after the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention had a uh, convention, elected a new president. And uh, there were a couple of items that were on the table, such as the abolition of abortion. Um, and also a a, an appeal, uh, a repeal of some sort. Uh, I didn't follow the whole convention, but Resolution 9 is addresses critical race theory and intersectionality. And uh, those were tried to be, uh, they were trying to either rescind that or to amend it to get it off the, um, uh, the committee and all those things. I, I really don't know what the inner workings of the SBC are. There are people that can speak to that. But it's just interesting how the optics look, and that's what I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, this is a video that I'm going to share with you in a moment. As I do that, I'm going to switch screens. There you are. And there I'm back. Uh, I will minimize myself here. So this video right here is what I'm going to play. So let me do that. First, let me do this. What you don't see... Hopefully, I'm hoping not to get any feedback in here. Let me mute this. Hopefully, I'm going to mute that. Okay. So if you're in the comments, I'm going to follow the comments section. If anyone's here, say hello. I have a box up for that. We can talk. Um, all right. Let's play this video here. I'll raise the volume up a little bit. This is Aaron Burnett, and this is the newly elected president, Pastor Ed Litton of the Southern Baptist Convention. Let's see what they have to say. And thank you for speaking out. You're um, you are facing a cultural divide. Uh, people are around this country and uh, in, in your church as well. And especially on the issue of critical race theory, the Southern Baptist Convention's adopting the theory, which recognizes that systemic racism is part of American society, challenges laws that promote inequality. Uh, but a conservative Southern Baptist pastor, Mike Stone, says, quote, our Lord isn't woke. What do you say to those in, in, in your own, uh, in your own uh, convention who believe that the church is drifting too far to the left? Yeah, it, we're, there's really no moderate wing of the Southern Baptist Convention, and I am certainly not a moderate by any theological definition. I'm very conservative in my faith, my theology, and as you mentioned in your piece, in my politics. But the reality is, 
we're facing real cultural needs in the cities that we are pastoring and trying to minister to people's desires, hearts, desires, and needs, and they're especially, especially their need for the gospel and to know the love of Jesus Christ. And so this is not a leftward drift at all, and it's, a, it's, a, it's not a good characterization because there are no real moderates in Southern Baptist life. Which, you know, I understand that, but but the criticism nonetheless comes to you from another pastor. Our right. Lord isn't woke, you know, angry that, that, that you're recognizing as a group uh, critical race well, theory. What, what do you say to that? How no, do you explain? No, let me say, yeah. yeah, I can explain very simply. We've never condoned critical race theory. As a matter of fact, at this convention, we've been very clear repeatedly that it is a, it's a philosophy, it's a worldview, it's a way of seeing things in the culture we live in, but we do not adopt it. Uh, we may teach it in our seminaries only to help pastors understand that it's it's a mechanism used in our culture, and we we have to understand it because. So, so you're saying you do the not recognize that the, the, the Southern Baptist Convention is adopting the theory um, that oh. recognizes systemic racism as part of American society. You're saying that that's not true. No, I didn't say that's true. I didn't say there isn't systemic racism. That's obvious. I'm saying that we do not prescribe to critical race theory. I want to tell you right there, I'm on the outside looking in, right? That sounds double-minded. That definitely sounds double-minded there because you're saying one thing and doing another, and that is not good. And that's what was part of what you just said. We, we do not prescribe to it. That's a, that's a false narrative. Okay, uh, we so, believe in gospel. Okay. We believe in gospel reconciliation. One of the reasons. Okay, but I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe maybe we're just misunderstanding each other in the words. But I, I really okay. I do want to try to understand this because I think it is so crucial. So you're saying there is systemic racism, but there are some who say even in your own your own faith group uh, that quote our Lord isn't woke that they're frustrated that you would even do that. How do you have those conversations when you feel so differently about something that's so crucial and core right now to what oh, this country it, is going through. It is crucial to what our country is going through. And I, the answer to that question is the Jesus tells us to come, the word of God tells us to come reason together. And, and so what our desire is that when we come to our convention, that we gather, we reaffirm our, our doctrinal statements and no, nothing changed in any of our doctrinal statements in this convention. And they won't. Uh, that we reaffirm who we are, what our mission is as a convention of almost 50,000 churches. Yes. And, and so we reaffirm those things, but we, we need a better conversation about this because these allegations are false. We are not. And let me tell you why I think this is happening is because there are people who are afraid of dealing with this issue. And it's basically. I don't believe there are people afraid of dealing with this issue. The issue is the gospel. And what he's saying on, in, the, in the beginning part all sounds good. I would agree with that on the surface. It's the underlying issue here of what he's, of what he's, of him, he himself, he's accusing those within the Southern Baptist country that are trying to reform it, right? He's referring to his, the opponent, Mike Stone, who's trying to say, you know, our Lord's not woke, it, this is the thing, like you're you're allowing politics and identity politics, politics and CRT and intersectionality, all of that to drive the message of the gospel. It doesn't need that. The gospel is the gospel. Jesus Christ, the message of the cross, right? It's foolishness to the world. And this is what foolishness is, is you're, you're talking to foolishness. Uh, and uh, let's just continue to play the clip. Basically recognize... I really appreciate your time and thank you for speaking out. Some reason together. And and so what our desire is that when we come to our convention, that we gather, we reaffirm our, our doctrinal statements and no, nothing changed in any of our doctrinal statements in this convention. And they won't. Uh, that we reaffirm who we are, what our mission is as a convention of almost 50,000 churches. Yes. And, and so we reaffirm those things, but we, we need a better conversation about this because these allegations are false. We are not. And let me tell you why I think this is happening is because there are people who are afraid of dealing with this issue. And it's basically recognizing that people of color in our communities are creating the image of God. They have value because God not only loved them, he redeems them, and, and God wants them in his family. 
Mm-hmm. And, and so it's our mission to help get that gospel message to everybody. So, so let me ask you another thing, and I, and I know this. You know, there's a recent poll, I'm sure you're well aware of this, Pastor, that shows 25% of white evangelicals believe in the QAnon conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. I spoke to Reverend, Reverend Russell Moore uh, recently. Obviously, you, you know him. He said huh? he was speaking to pastors from every denomination. He told me, saying, literally every single day, and they're talking about this problem. Some pastors are promoting the sentiment behind this theory in their sermons. Others are trying to combat it. But I want to play some of the pastors that are putting this to their uh, their flocks, along with former Christian QAnon uh, believers. So that's what you're going to hear here. Yeah. There is a demonic hedge of protection around Joe Biden. Joe Biden is a fake president. We have many people in our government that are very compromised. And there's a plan that's trying to turn that over to get them and put these people behind bars, okay? Even the groups that I was in, I was like, I'm going to these more than, you know, I go to church once a week. I'm up here for two hours every single night, like committed to these. And I was like, that's probably not right. And then I started thinking, am I putting even Trump above God? CNN also spoke to a retired Southern Baptist pastor, uh, Parker Neff in Mississippi, and he said he believed in QAnon. His, his comment was, quote, it just seemed to be good, solid, conservative thought. Pastor, have you encountered this? I mean, what can be done about this? Well, first of all, I have not encountered it in my church. I, have not, I, I don't know very many pastors who have. I think it's a fringe problem. Uh, and, and so f- almost 50,000 Southern Baptist churches, I think most pastors are doing this. They're faithfully teaching God's Word every week. They open the Bible. They bring messages of life to people, hope to people. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, conspiracy theories are all across our culture. So I don't think it's just some churches doing this. I think there's all kinds of fringe elements that will believe a lie rather than the truth. That may be true. So I guess you're taking issue with the poll of 25%. Another pastor told me he thought it was about 10% of most of the congregations he knew. I guess the question I would ask you, pastors, do you feel any, any burden, obligation, responsibility to try to stop this, whether you define it as fringe or not? Well, no, it is fringe, but uh, yes, I have a, I have a, an obligation with my people, especially that I teach on a regular basis. To, to not listen to fables, and, and the scripture is very clear about that, and, and so, but to build your life on the word of God. That's the... All right, I, I will give it to him. He does answer this correctly. So there are fringe, fringes out there that believe in QAnon and all of those things. I don't speak to that because you can get caught up in that, and it'll be like an endless trap, and you're not focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So to his credit, he does answer this correctly. The foundation of our lives, and, and so the Bible is very real, and it's very it, it deals with real life issues, and, and so yeah, there are conspiracy theories, and there are people that follow those things. But our people, and I think our pastors throughout the Southern Baptist Convention, you will find are faithfully every week shepherding their flocks with the Word of God. So they ended that conversation there. I just thought that was interesting. There was a little bit of equivocation in the beginning there where he started speaking very truly, but at the same time, almost like he was denying the presence and he's adopting leftist attitudes to critical race theory because they adopted it as Resolution 9 in 2019 as uh, analytical tools. So... Just to drive the conversation a little bit further, what I wanted to talk about, we're going to go in this direction. What is all of that stuff? And I have the video here from Reform Wiki who did a really good video here that explains this. So I'll, I'll play its entirety here and hopefully Reform Wiki will allow me to do that. Um, I did ask permission. I didn't get a word back. But I feel it's it's going to speak to the conversation. So let's play this video. So what do these guys give us? A number of things. Namely, critical theory. Have you heard the idea of critical race theory? It's a grandchild of the Frankfurt School. Political correctness. Multiculturalism. Any 
any of these things sound familiar? So as a result of these ideologies, we have all been taught over time through our media, through our educational systems, to view ourselves not as part of a whole, but as part of subgroups. As part of subgroups who in some way, shape, fashion, or form are being oppressed by the hegemonic power that rules and governs our culture. And so even when we talk about elections, we don't talk about this person is ahead in the polls by this much, that person is it. No, this person is ahead with red-headed, left-handed white people from the South, while this person is getting the vote of second-generation migrant workers with eczema. Why do we talk like that? Why do we think about politics that way? Why do we think about each other that way? Why do ideas like intersectionality from Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 gain such popularity that people use it like like we know what it is. By the way, if you don't know what intersectionality is, just what's the hegemonic power? White, male, heterosexual, cisgendered, able-bodied, native-born American people. That's the man, right? You ever heard that saying, you know, the man keeping us down? That's the man. And by the way, the list could go on and on and on. Intersectionality, in a nutshell, basically is the idea that to the degree that you don't have those things, you are oppressed. And so if you are male, heterosexual, cisgendered, right, native-born, American, able-bodied, by the way, also attractive, there's pretty privilege too, by the way, Um, If you are all those things, but you're not white, right, then your oppression is limited to this area. But what if you're not white, but you're also not male? Now, that place where your not whiteness and your not maleness intersects is where you feel the weight of the oppression. But what if you're not white and not male and not heterosexual? Well, now the oppression is even worse on you because you have these three intersections of oppression. What if you're not white, not male, not heterosexual, and not cisgendered? Ooh. So now you are a black, trans, male, lesbian... Anyway, you're... (laughs) Now there are four intersections of oppression, right? Well, if you're not white and you're not male and you're not heterosexual and you're not cisgendered and you're not able-bodied or you're not a native-born American, you're an immigrant or you're not a, you see, intersectionality says that the level of oppression and the kind of oppression that you experience combines itself in these areas and layers itself in these areas, these intersections, if you will. But what is that? If not a grown up expression of cultural Marxism. Thanks for watching.
If I were you, I would subscribe to the Reform Wiki. He has some really good videos. You should definitely check that out. And that explains in a short video what that theory really is and what's permeating schools, what's permeating even churches. And listen, we love our brothers and sisters no matter what nation they come from, right? There's no way in which we have a lens to look through only through the scripture. That's our lens. That's our lens. We don't divide people. We bring them together. We're all one in Christ. I mean, the, the scripture speaks to this. So that was an, an interesting video. If you want to follow that, I'll again, when I'm done producing this video, I'll put the link in the description and uh, you can check that out. So I won't speak much to it other than what Vody has done there. What I want to show you is the answer. What is the answer to that? But before I do that, the answer obviously we know is the gospel, and I will share two instances in which that is all about. But what I want to do, one thing I want to show you is an update on Grace Community Church. And I did not say that in the beginning. I kind of mentioned it briefly. Here is a article here from the Daily News uh, in California, uh, Phil Johnson tweeted this, I think, yesterday or earlier today. It was an article that was updated maybe about two days ago. I didn't see it, and he said it was buried there. So in his tweet, he said this was a, a buried news article. So let's read this article together. A judge has agreed to delay next week's scheduled hearing on whether he should cancel a preliminary injunction he issued last summer against a Sun Valley church. We know that as Grace Community that flouted coronavirus health mandates, saying he wants to give lawyers for the House of Worship and Los Angeles time to discuss a possible settlement. So here we go. I mean, this is uh, now that all these numbers have dropped and they really, really weren't that high to begin with in this area to warrant all of those lockdowns and mandates. Uh, the preliminary injunction was issued last September 10th by... Uh, L.A. Superior Court Judge Mitchell Beckloff as a way of stemming the spread of the coronavirus based in part on evidence presented by the L.A. County Department of Public Health and Grace Community Church was holding indoor, day, indoor Sunday services, prompting the county to sue the church on August 14th. The county then sought contempt proceedings against John MacArthur for continuing to hold indoor services and for not enforcing masking and social distancing in violation of Beckloff's injunction because the county subsequently allowed indoor church services to resume amid declining COVID-19 infection rates. County lawyers later said they wanted the church and pastor found in contempt only on the masking and social distancing issues for the preliminary injunction to be enforced for 25% indoor capacity. But in court papers filed May 8th, county attorneys asked that the hearing on the church's motion to vacate the injunction as well as the contempt issue, not go forward on June 23rd because the quote parties the parties are presently discussing the terms of a settlement that would resolve this entire action and obviate the need for the court to decide the motion to vacate. The hearing, if necessary, is now scheduled for July 30th. Grace Community Church attorneys cite the two recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions in their motion to lift the preliminary injunction in its entirety and end the county's effort contempt effort in one a catholic diocese of of a group of jewish synagogues challenged and a group of jewish synagogues challenged new york governor andrew cuomo's restrictions on churches and one the church's attorneys argue in their court papers then on february 5th the high court struck down the indoor worship ban while allowing caps on attendance and ban on singing according to the church's attorneys i believe that's the end of the article if I'm not mistaken, we'll go a little bit up. Yeah, that's so that's interesting how uh, the the judge here is giving them a, a chance to settle this case. So that should be interesting. And if you follow the Bible thumping wing, that guy, he's gone over that before of other churches in California set, settling with the um, with the state. So this looks like. Uh, Grace Community Church and all these churches in the United States are looking uh, in the rearview mirror on this issue. However, turning the turning the page there, 
Canada is a whole different story. And we, uh, I didn't update this on you, but this has been updated on other channels. Uh, apparently, the Canadian pastor Tim Stevens was arrested a second time. Uh, arrested on new charges after underground worship following church building seizure. So his building was seized, just like Pastor James Coates in Alberta, Canada, with uh, Grace Life Church. His building was seized, and I think to this day is still seized. And I haven't been talking too much on this issue because it's it's been prolonged. But I felt like you're seeing the contrast in California and, uh, and the differences in Canada is that uh, these mandates and lockdowns are still in effect. Uh, so, according to Rebel News, and this is under ChristianNews.net, uh, uh, Rebel News Pastor Stim Tim Stevens was arrested on Monday afternoon on a new charge after Fairview Baptist Church gathered for underground worship for the second week in a row. Week in a row, since their church was effectively seized by AHS, that's Alberta Health Services. Alberta authorities were forced to drop other charges against Pastor Tim last month after they never served him with the court order. So they served it to the wrong person. Again, that's been documented on the BTWN News. You can go there and check that out. That effect effectively ended that case against Pastor Tim, but he will now be facing another legal battle. Over the weekend, an ever-going crowd gathered at the undisclosed location and shared the words, sang songs of praise, and heard Pastor Tim preach. As worship progressed, a police helicopter discovered the gathered congregation. So let's play this clip in which he was arrested a second time. I'm Sosio for Rebel News, and I'm outside of the home of Pastor Tim Stevens. Pastor Tim was once again taken into custody. Numerous police vehicles arrived and put him in a car, taking him away from his families. It was an extremely emotional and harrowing ordeal, and we were there to capture it as it happened. I'm going to let you go now to the footage of his arrest. <coughs> So that's what you're under arrest for. I mean, you can hear the child's cry, and that just... That has to hurt. That has to hurt. I, I gotta stop the video just to reflect on that. I didn't really talk about this when this first happened, but I... To have that happen a second time when there are... There are no words to know that Canada is really going down the, the route of third world nations in which they just lock up people for this virus. And here we have our country, United States, looking in the rearview mirror, so to speak. And uh, you can argue that the whole during the whole pandemic uh, of these lockdowns, diff states did things differently. Um, but, I mean, it's a it's been a year over a well over a year and you know this is the second time that he's been arrested the other time he was arrested i think in the church parking lot if i'm not mistaken and this is at his house <laughs> So apparently the criminals can go whatever they want to do, be released. You know, we've documented that before. But a pastor who preaches and pastors this church is, he's top on the list to make a public spectacle of. It's, it's a shame. Okay. Bye, Daddy. Bye, guys. 
wicked, very wicked. Uh, I can't say anything else but that. That's very wicked. I have children my, myself, and he has more children than I do, but I, I just, to have your children separated from you and you're going to jail because you're a pastor, it's mindless. That's what it is. It's mindless. Uh, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop it there, but look at that. Holding his kids through the behind bars in a, in a car. And yet, look at his demeanor. Smiling. That's somebody who's firmly trusting in the Lord. And it's certainly not easy for him, I'm sure. So keep Pastor Tim Stevens in your prayers. Uh, going underground has a price. And I'll share something else with you. Somebody who else went underground. We know that as Pastor James Coates. So in this sermon which was released a few hours ago and only has 400 something views and i i'm going to put the link in the description of this video as well again at this moment it's what june it's like 10 at night right now june 17th this was a few days ago on the lord's day and the last few minutes of this sermon is an appeal maybe the people in canada maybe the government officials in canada will listen to this sermon and think about their need for Jesus Christ. And, of course, I'm not going to play the whole sermon. It's just an hour long. Um, uh, 44 minutes long. I'm, I'm sorry. And I'm going to show you this sermon. And hopefully you have the time to, to watch this or listen to this, rather. So let's do that. Let me cue up Pastor James Coates on the screen so you know who's speaking. And I will disappear. So this is a gospel appeal here that he's sharing. So let's do that right now. But there's one more appeal. And this actually comes from the Apostle John. This time appealing to the testimony of John the Baptist. And so if you're taking notes, just briefly jot this down. The appeal to testimony. The appeal to testimony verse 40 and he went away again beyond the jordan to the place where john was first baptizing and he was staying there and so jesus returns to the place where it all began verse 41 many came to him and were saying well john performed no sign yet everything john said about this man was true john had long been since dead beheaded by King Herod. And though John didn't perform any signs, the clarity and veracity of his testimony was so strong that people could say everything he said about Jesus was true. He was a faithful witness. Jesus was everything John had said he would be and more. So, verse 42, many believed in him there in contrast to the religious leaders and so the question for you is what's your response do you embrace the testimony god the father has given concerning his son do you look at his works and believe that because of those works the father is in him and he in the father do you accept him as the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world? Do you, do you look to him as the one who laid down his life for the forgiveness of sins? Do you confess him as the one who, who conquered the grave, rising on the third day? Do you recognize him to be the one that is now seated at the Father's right hand, awaiting that time when he would return to bring judgment upon the ungodly? Or do you stand with the religious leaders, rejecting the Father's testimony concerning His Son, rejecting the testimony of John the Baptist, the, the testimony of John the Apostle, the testimony of all the Apostles, the testimony of those whose lives have been transformed by the resurrected Christ? Do you stand with the religious leaders who are unwilling to assess the facts as they are, who are confronted with the truth and reality of who Jesus is, but nevertheless still hate and reject him? 
There's only one right response, and it's to come to Christ by faith to recognize that all of us have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And that without the righteousness of Christ, you will stand before him on the the day that you die and give an account for your life with with no coverage, with nothing to, to, to appeal to. And you'll be under the judgment of God where every violation of his law will be brought to account. And the just judgment of Sinning against a holy God is an eternity in hell. You don't want to go into that moment without the righteousness of Christ. And if you would believe on him, if you would look to Jesus and embrace him as your Lord and Savior, if you would trust in him for the forgiveness of your sin, you will be given a righteousness not your own. It will be counted to you. And you will stand before God holy and blameless. And when it's time to, 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 to face the judgment, you will make one appeal and it will be to the righteousness of Christ. And so I would just urge you today to believe on his name, be reconciled to God. The father sent his son to be the savior of the world. And if you would trust in him, you will be saved. Amen. And so look to him this day and experience the forgiveness of sin and regeneration and come into this glorious union with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What a sermon. And that's the last four minutes of it, right? A gospel presentation at the end there. Amazing. And you can listen to that sermon. I'll put the link in the description. And you can check that out and something to think about here you got a pa- another pastor who's underground and uh obviously if you listen to the beginning of that sermon you'll hear some birds chirping so he's outside where we don't know and we'll keep it at that but interesting how we have those two stories and here in america we're arguing over crt and all those other things, intersectionality, being divided up by the political class, right? So what's another answer? What needs to happen, right? Pastor James Coates puts a good message there. I recommend you listen to that. There's one more video I want you to read, uh, see. I don't think I have it up. It's Reformed Wiki. He had another video up, but we'll we'll play this one. This is another. Uh, where is it? I'm gonna have to find it. You give me a minute. I will find that video. We'll switch it up here. While I'm doing that, again, please go to my channel, like, subscribe, share. Go to the BibleThippingWingnut.com and you can check that out as well. Hey everybody, this is Josh Fritz of the Godcast. Thank you. For- you can see my tr- trailer there playing right now. I gotta find this video. Give me one second while I do that. I'll be right back. Okay, I found that video, and I want to show it to you right now. There we go. Let's get Pastor James off the screen. I'll close the video out with this. I had another video, but I'm not going to share it. It'll go on too long. This will be the video that closes us out here. And again, Reform Wiki comes to the rescue here. Go to his channel. Like and subscribe to him. Um... I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, and it'll bring more attention to his channel, hopefully. I'm a I'm a drop in the bucket, so I'm sure he'll appreciate that. So, here's the answer.
We want to have a full understanding of the doctrine of salvation. However, you do not have to have a complete understanding of the doctrine of salvation to be saved. What you need to know for that is very simple. That you are a sinner in need of a savior and that God has provided a savior through the person and work of Jesus Christ and that you must abandon all reliance on yourself and what you can do and flee to Christ and put your trust in who he is and what he has done. You don't have to understand every aspect of that. When you come to Christ, you will not know everything about him. You will spend eternity unfolding the mystery and the majesty of who Christ is, and you will never run out of mystery and majesty. But you don't have to know all the mystery and majesty in order to know you're a sinner in need of a savior. He is the savior whom God has provided. Ah, so that we just go on and just live any way we want to? Yes. Because when you're his, he'll even change your want to. Amen? The true Christian is not the one who lives a way he doesn't want to. The true Christian is the one who has his want to changed. Amen, somebody. We're transformed and conformed to the very image of Christ so that even our desires are different. Do, do you see the difference in those two things? And this is why people don't want Christianity. You ask somebody out there, what's a Christian? Well, a Christian is a person who no longer does stuff that's ple pleasant or pleasing. A Christian is the one who, you know, they put their head down and they march on slowly through this life with all pleasure removed. Hey man, you wanna go do so and so? Ah, no. Why? That sounds enjoyable, must not be Christian. That's not Christianity, people. This is a transforming reality. And when we become a part of this transforming reality, it transforms us. And we now live to the glory of God. Because we now want to live to the glory of God. Amen? the beauty of the covenant of redemption. So I ask you the question again, are you a Christian? So first and foremost, it's important that we get the gospel right because if we don't, there are people out there, including ourselves, who will be duped into believing that they are right with God when in fact they are at enmity with him. And that's the video. Go and like and subscribe to that channel. I mean, he's got plenty of subscribers, but man, well, that was a great video. So with that, thank you guys for watching tonight. I'll pop on soon sometime. You'll see. I'll be back. Some things to think about. Pray for the Southern Baptist Convention. Pray for them with their new leadership. Hopefully he'll be different than what's being what's being seen um, those analytical tools that are being used to interpret the Bible will be rescinded. And obviously, Vody Bakum speaks very well to that um, against those things. Uh, also, pay, pray for the Canadian, Canadian pastors, Pastor Tim Stevens, and pray for 
uh, Pastor James Coates and all the other pastors, frankly, in Canada. Uh, there's uh, another pastor, Jacob, uh, up there as well. All of these men that are in Canada, there, I'm sure there are others that were not even not even notable. They're underground, and they are under persecution. Praise the Lord for Grace Community Church and the fact that there's going, they're moving towards well, the, the judges recommending to issue towards a settlement with the state. We'll see how that goes. And uh, also, just pray for the gospel to advance and to save sinners. Obviously, we know that it will. Jesus said he will lose none that the Father has given to him. He shall lose none. And I'm butchering that verse, I know for sure. But if you go to John 6, you'll definitely find it. Uh, the Lord will lose none in saving people for himself. And uh, the Lord is going to be the one that saves. And the Father is the one that calls. And the Holy Spirit seals and indwells. So, thank you for watching. We'll see you here next time. Please like, subscribe to this channel and also to the church's channel. I'll leave that link in the description. Hopefully, I'll get all those links lined up. You'll be able to watch each one. And uh, God bless you guys. We'll see you here next time on the Godcast. Take care.